everybody, you're listening to Mars Talk, a community discussion about humanity's future in space. Mars Talk is a production of the Mars Society. We are the world's largest nonprofit organization dedicated to sending humans to Mars and settling Mars. I'm this week's host, James Burke. I'm filling in for Christopher Tarantola. Chris is enjoying some well-deserved time off, but he'll be back for the next episode. This is episode number seven. All of our episodes can be found in either audio or video format. We're up on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube. You can find links to everything as well as all of our social media on our website, marstalk.org, marstalk.org. We want you to help. We are looking for social media, scheduling, and editing volunteers. Email us at info at marstalk.org. And as always, we want to advise our listeners that all the positions expressed in this podcast are the views of the individual and are not necessarily the views or position of the Mars Society. We are a large international organization, and while we share in our core belief that we should have humans living on Mars, we may and probably will disagree on many other things. A little bit about me, uh, I've been a technical project manager for over 20 years. I'm also a software developer. I was a founding member of the Mars Society, which means I've been a member since the organization started back in 1998. Mm -hmm. I live in Seattle and I helped get our Seattle chapter started back then. I've also been the IT director of the Mars Society since 2011. Last year, I was proud and honored to join our steering committee, which governs the organization. Professionally, I worked at Microsoft from the late 90s until recently. Earlier this year, I joined a consulting company called Arctic Consulting. We are a startup with presences here in Seattle and in Orange County, California. We specialize in all types of application development, data reporting, data warehousing, also helping companies with their business models and their project management. My role with the Mars Society though is as a volunteer and as a chapter leader and a leader of some of our technical projects. We'll get into the virtual reality Mars VR project today a bit, but I also help work on our online Marspedia encyclopedia and other technical projects we have. You can find out more about Marspedia at marspedia.org. Now joining me today is Ali Zari. Ali is a product designer and concept developer who studied at the University of Hertfordshire, uh, graduated in 2003. After his studies, he traveled to Europe and Southeast Asia to get an overview of technology and cultural trends and development while freelancing. He started as an entrepreneur in 2005 and right away got interested in value creation between companies and organizations on a national and international level through Innovation Norway. He built up projects and concept designs for Canon UK presented back in 2001 which led to the first ideas for 360 degree camera systems in 2002. And he followed up on the interest for, in cameras and filmmaking with a one year course in film and TV sciences in 2007 and eight and design and architectural history in 2008 and nine. Ollie has been interested and engaged in business cluster dynamics, functionalities development since 2006 leading up to founding VR Oslo International Business Cluster in 2017, which is Norway's fastest growing business cluster to date. VR Oslo is owned by Adapa360, which is the brand name for two Adapa companies. And Adapa is the name of the first civilized man based on Sumerian and Mesopotamian history. Both companies were founded in the spring and summer of 2013, and these two companies will be explained in more detail later. So Ali, tell us a little bit about yourself. It's a great pleasure to be on the same platform as uh, the many heavy hitters in the space industry and the uh, Mars uh, exploration uh, front, so to say. And obviously, uh, Dr. Zubrin being uh, the main figure here. Well, tell us about your time when you created the, the first 360-degree helmet. Uh, well, that started off in, uh, in 2011. Um, I've been interested in uh, ancient history and done a bit of study of my own time, trying to figure out our own history in this. And coming from uh, uh, Persia or Iran, so to say, 
uh, that history covers Mesopotamia and uh, Sumerian history as well. So uh, covering that ground, you always end up looking at some pyramids and the Egyptian pyramids and stuff like that. So this led me to Bosnia in 2011. And uh, they, they say that they have a pyramid down there. So I went down there, talked to the archaeologists and stuff like that, wanted to do a documentary. And then when we were on this uh, uh, mountain uh, structure, uh, we, filming with my mobile wasn't really covering the grounds, literally. So with the mobile when I was recording, it just looked like a, like a hill. So uh, I thought maybe having a 360 degree uh, headset on would kind of show the real perspective of where we were at. So that's where it all started. And uh, it's, it's been eight years now. And how did you get started with space? Uh, space has been a childhood dream, really. Um, so I was, uh, as I was telling you earlier on, my father got me a huge collection of science books back when I was uh, seven, eight years old. So I kind of stormed through all those and everything about natural sciences. And then, of course, astronomy was the big, uh, big thing for me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I've always made my own little telescopes, you know, binoculars didn't really work out to look at the stars. So I was trying to make my own telescope that didn't, didn't really work to begin with. But uh, yeah, that's where ideas for developing stuff came about, making my own things. And then of course, uh, optics and uh, cameras and stuff like that. My father was always a big camera guy. So, uh, and then of course, astronomy and Mars definitely. What and do how, do, how do you want to merge those two things together, cameras and, and space and Mars? It was all by chance, really. Uh, the interest for cameras kind of grew. Uh, and then my, I wanted to, like everybody who's into astronomy, wants to connect the camera to a telescope and take some pictures, right? So that has always been like a um, big challenge for me to uh, make it happen. And then um, I wanted to become an astronomer, but then kind of drifted over to uh, architecture and design. We actually moved to Canada. I used to live in Vancouver for about three years just to be a bit closer to- Oh, wow, you were pretty close to me then. Yeah, <laughs> it's an odd thing. I was thinking about that yesterday. So uh, between uh, 95 and 98, I was in Vancouver. Well, well I actually flew back uh, to Norway from Seattle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in 1998. Uh, so, yeah, and um, the idea for design came about. So I ended up doing some uh, product design studies, and then from then again, designed some camera concepts for Canon. And then, uh, for everyone that's an 80s kid, has seen like VR and stuff. You know, the development of VR and how it never came about in a full-fledged way. Uh, it all kind of just tied together after I had this idea in Bosnia for this Hedrick. So uh, uh, all the time I've been seeking how to do something regarding to space, with regards to space, and uh, with the Mars Society, uh, that, that has kind of come to fruition. And what do you hope to do in the future uh, with cameras? Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about the project you worked on uh, in the desert in Spain. Mm. Uh, in 2015, uh, I was uh, contacted by uh, an uh, analog uh, uh, astronaut uh, called Diego Urbina, who was part of the Mars 500 project uh, at the IBMP in Russia. And uh, he saw one of my head rigs that was actually used by um, a skydiver, a female skydiver that jumps for Red Bull. And then uh, I was looking for um, uh, test partners. And then he's like, uh, we have an upcoming um, moon and Mars analog. Would you be able to design a system for a spacesuit? So uh, obviously that was a major hit. <laughs> I love the proposal. And it took me about seven months to put together a concept. And uh, that concept has kind of grown. Um, and now, uh, hopefully for the future, as you, you've been involved with as well, uh, we want to do uh, first an analog spacesuit, smart spacesuit, and hopefully find the funding to do a full-fledged uh, 
interplanetary smart space. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into it later, but uh, I've been working with you to try to get some of these cameras down to our Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. So I'm holding up one of them here. Here's one of the rigs that you created. This is basically three Kodak cameras. If you think of like a GoPro Fusion, it's yeah. similar to that, but, but this camera rig will take 360 video and it's something you designed. It has a 3D printed uh, element in the center that you designed. Yeah. So that's the kind of work you do. It's a very, that one is a very simple construction. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, uh, that was made to fit the system on a tripod because that's, that's like a standard. But the thing was that these three cameras were actually, those cameras were actually on an analog spacesuit that you can see in the background here. Um, and they were both underwater because they have underwater casing. And then they were in the desert as well in uh, Rio Tinto in Spain. And that's actually where the Apollo uh, team was also training for the moon uh, projects. Awesome. So, yeah, it, it was uh, really, uh, for us at Adapa, 360 and for me personally that kind of was a royal push into the space sector so after that it's just been a major focus in that direction yeah and so you you've always been interested in space now you're able to kind of work on things that are helping get us in, out into space um that's awesome and it's also kind of similar to my background uh when I, I got started with space, I, I went down to the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. when I was young, and my mom said, uh, took me to the gift shop, said, Which, what, what do you want me to get you? And she actually got me this book here. It's called The Omni Space Almanac. It was printed in 1997, and mm -hmm. uh, I've had this my whole life. It's got a bunch of great timelines in it for when we're going to go back mm -hmm. to the moon and out to Mars. So, for example, it says we'll have a Mars base in 2035, so it's a pretty good book. It's correct so far about that at least someone's had some clear visions in that book right there absolutely so let's get into the news shall we yeah definitely all right so this week insight uh, uncovered the mole so we talked about this uh, on a last a past podcast with mars talk uh this is nasa's latest lander on mars insight as an instrument called the hp3 it's designed to self-hammer down several meters into the surface to measure temperature and seismic activity, but it's been stuck uh, due to they think a lack of friction in the loose regolith there uh, at that site on Mars. And so they've the, the team at JPL has developed a plan over the last several months to lift up the probe's cover to see what was going on uh, and perhaps use the lander's robotic arm to help the probe get more, more friction. And so as you can see from these short series of photos that we're showing you right now, they have successfully, successfully lifted the cover to see the probe. And looking at the photo, it does appear that the probe has lost friction as the loose regolith has opened up and the hole is much wider than the probe itself. So basically there's this cavity around the hole, which they're gonna try to address by pressing on the soil with the scoop on the end of the robot arm. Um, however, it's still possible that they may have hit a rock. That was the other alternative theory of what's going on, why the probe is stuck. Um, they may have hit a rock. If that's the case, they might not be able to uh, go any further, but they're going to keep trying. Right now, they're just kind of taking things slow and steady, making sure that they know exactly what they can do, and uh, testing and discussing everything that they're seeing. Um, so uh, stay tuned for future updates on this. Uh, the mission... Uh, is still underway and it's possible they could address this issue and get that probe down digging deeper so that it can explore Mars core and the seismic activity of Mars, which is the goal of the mission. Two things that were quite cool with this mission as well, which hasn't gotten that, uh, that much of attention, <clears throat> uh, was that uh, they also recorded uh, the wind on Mars. Yes. You could listen to that was quite amazing to sit there with the headphones on and then listening to the mars wind blowing that's uh, yeah that's that was pretty amazing for me as well uh just to hear the what, what it would sound like on mars for the first yeah. time it's crazy and then um, when the uh, actual lander hit uh hit ground the the first images that came out <clears throat> once i got a hold of those images i saw that they were uh, they had mounted a fisheye lens, and being a panoramic photographer, uh, 
right away. I put that into the software. I panned it out so you could actually pan around in the image, uh, which was the first uh, first version of that image mm -hmm. out there. So, yeah, a lot of exciting stuff coming from this mission. Absolutely, it's a great mission so far. Uh, Exo Mars is coming up in 2020, and the lander for that mission, it's a joint European-Russian mission, uh, the lander has suffered some parachute damage in test. Mm -hmm. um, basically, they did a flight test designed to demonstrate the parachute system from start to finish, and the pilot chute uh, suffered several tears, and there was also a tear in one of the main chutes. So all the other systems seem to work well, but the officials for the mission are still trying to determine the cause of these problems with the chutes. And they'll want to fix them before the plan launch next year. That's coming up pretty fast. There's actually several missions happening in 2020. Um, I, we just did a page on MarsPD that lists all of them, but there's five different missions happening, including the ExoMars. There's also the Mars 2020 rover that NASA is sending, which is a follow-up to the Curiosity rover they sent in 2012. Um, and there's several other missions there. So I'll put a link to the Marspedia page in the show notes. Are there, is there still a possibility to send people's names with this mission? It was this mission, right? Uh, I th there, are, there is a way to send names with the Mars 2020 rover that JPL is doing. And that's, I believe, uh, still available for a couple months. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure about ExoMars. Um, maybe we can t check that out and put some notes in the show notes about that. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, next story, SpaceX is targeting 2021 for the Starship launch. So that is the new rocket that they're building. It was formerly known as the BFR, or yeah. Big Falcon rocket. Yeah. Uh, now they're calling the top half of that the Starship. Um, and so basically, they're talking right now to a bunch of potential customers in the telecom industry space. This mission, uh, these, the, the first launch of Starship could take 20 metric tons to geostationary transfer orbit, or more than 100 metric tons to low Earth orbit. So this is a big sucker, okay? <laughs> um, this, is, this is a rocket that's on the same class as the Saturn V. Nice. Um, it's, a, it's, it's bigger than the Falcon Heavy. Yeah. And the reason it's able to be so big is they have a new engine called the Raptor. Um, they've already done a short hop of the Starship earlier this year. It basically took off a few centimeters, but they're going to do some future, uh, some additional hops later this year where they go higher than that. The goal is to get orbital as quickly as possible, potentially even this year with the full stack operational by the end of next year, the end of 2020 and then customers in early 2021. So these are very uh, quick development cycles they're doing. Um, you know, I would ask how much do we have to account for Elon time? Uh, he's always a little optimistic, but still like this is happening fast. Yeah. Um, another point to make, they've built the Raptor engine serial number six, and it is in testing right now in Texas. They've made some adjustments over serial numbers four and five and are achieving better results. Yeah. Um, and so I actually, I heard a little bit about this rocket. I was at the ISDC conference last year yeah. and the SpaceX engineer um, was talking about mm. how they had built the Merlin engine that the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy use yeah. and that this one's coming in fast and coming in hot. It's going to be uh, a huge upgrade. Um, the Merlin engine's already the best engine in the world, the most efficient, and highest performing engine in the world, but the Raptor is a, a whole new generation better than yeah. that. So it's pretty exciting that this is coming up. Coming back to uh, what you called as Elon time, I think mm -hmm. uh, the optimism is in any product developer's mind. <clears throat> uh, you kind of have to have that optimism to push things along and, you know, uh, keep up the glow in the project uh, and then with time while things kind of fall into place that optimism slowly becomes realism so that timeline becomes more and more crystallized and clear that's a great point and we're seeing that with his other company tesla mm -hmm. where this last quarter they actually hit their production target for the first time and produce more tesla cars than they ever have 
Yep. So uh, you're right. Like having that optimism, while it may not be initially grounded in reality, it can certainly make reality as time goes on. Yeah, exactly. Now the BFR has 31 Raptor engines, so that's a lot of uh, power for one rocket, and that's can kind of show you the the capability it's going to have, not only to take large payloads up into Earth orbit, but mm -hmm. also to get us to the Mar to the Moon and Mars. Yeah. So. The other thing about uh, the Starship that I'm pretty amazed about and looking forward to. Uh, is the fact that they want to use this vehicle to uh, fly people around on Earth. So it's not just going to be an Earth to space uh, way of travel. It's going to be point to point on Earth and then really <clears throat> shrinking uh, the Earth big time with regards to travel and uh, uh, logistics. So being able to travel from New York to London in under 30 minutes, that's, that's, that's just gonna be amazing. Yeah, that's a great point where they, if they're able to pull that off, mm -hmm. it could really disrupt the airline industry because if you can go from New York to Shanghai, China in 40 minutes yeah. and uh, about the cost of a first class ticket, yeah. then that's really gonna make, it, that's gonna be a game changer. So. And he's also mentioning that it will actually be a, a greener solution than having ordinary airline flights. Um, next story, the White House's Office of Management and Budget, so this is part of the Trump administration, mm -hmm. they're trying to kill the Lunar Gateway as it's not technically needed for a lunar landing mission, which is something we've been talking about at the Mars Society. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zubrin's been out there saying that for the past year plus. Um, but now what the White House, you know, the Trump administration is starting to come around to this line of thinking. Yeah. They, they're arguing now that killing the Lunar Gateway would actually make the Artemis program faster and cheaper. Hmm, sounds familiar for <laughs> Mars Society folks that have been listening to this podcast. I think somebody at the White House, White House has been listening to the Mars Society. <laughs> yeah, they may have been listening to this podcast. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, basically, um, you know, this is something that is coming out this week. NASA is is still advocating for it. Jim Bridenstine, the NASA administrator, you know, he's representing both NASA and industry's positions that the gateway is better mm -hmm. because it will lead to a more sustainable moon return. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to see and to hear that the uh, White House is kind of coming around to the idea that maybe this Lunar Gateway space station is not necessarily needed to go back to the moon. It'll be interesting to see what happens here. I think with regards to uh, our civilization, we're still taking baby steps with regards to space. Uh, while on the ground, we, we're looking around us, we, as humanity, we might feel very technologically advanced uh, at times. And we are getting there slowly, slowly being uh, the word here. But with regards to space, uh, we're still very in the infancy. Mm -hmm. Okay, next story. Uh, Homer Hickam, if you remember the movie October Sky, he wrote the book on, he was featured in that movie. He was a young uh, rocket designer during, young rocket engineer during the Apollo mission era. He wrote a long editorial uh, recently on his website uh, correctly stating that NASA has no plans to get to Mars right now. Even though they're out there talking about we're going to go back to the moon and then on to Mars, he, they don't really have credible plans for Mars. And he talks in his article about seven different technologies that would need to be developed for a Mars mission or a human to Mars mission, but, and that they're not really doing any of them right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then he also takes one step further and says that NASA shouldn't have a plan to go to Mars and goes into a lot of detail about why people think that Mars is a viable destination. It goes back all the way back to Percival Lowell, uh, the, the man, the rich, uh, you know, New York philanthropist that built the Lowell Observatory in, uh, in uh, Arizona and was uh, really wrote the book back in the day about uh, Mars and the canals on Mars that he thought he saw and the potential civilization on Mars that he thought he saw really captured the 
popular imagination back about a hundred years ago. Um, uh, but, and he basically makes the point in this editorial he wrote that we are all living this fantasy <laughs> that Mars is a place that is uh, going to be like Earth. It's going to be this destination that people could live at easily. Um, and really what he's saying is that's not, there's really no potential for that. He talks about the first probes that NASA JPL sent to Mars, the Mariner 4 probe showed that Mars was a dead world. It had craters all over it like the moon. Um, and then there were some follow-up missions. And so he basically said that, you know, Percival Lowell has been refuted but we're, it's all creeping back in. His consciousness is creeping back into society that we're going to go to Mars and, you know, live there and, and all this stuff. And he really doesn't want to do that. He wants to go back to the moon and just focus on the moon. So I think we need to rebut this a little bit. What do you think, Ali? I think uh, a lot has changed since his time. And then uh, I've just barely got to run through the, the article here. And I was just... <laughs> Yeah. Well, let me just say, let me say that it's not true that Mars <laughs> has no potential to be a life-filled planet. Um, Mars actually has on it everything you would need to build a modern technical civilization. Yeah. You could make air from the carbon dioxide on Mars. There was an article that recently came out that if you reacted the carbon dioxide atmosphere on Mars with gold foil, you can actually bounce off the carbon dioxide molecules on the gold foil and, and break off the oxygen. Mm -hmm. And so you'd have breathable oxygen relatively easily. Yeah. Uh, you can also find water. There's water all over on Mars. Oh. There's even standing water on the surface now we've seen yeah. in some places. Yeah. Uh, there's a frozen lake that's pretty humongous as well on the surface. So we, if we can get water easily, then we can also make air and we can have water to drink and we can also make methane rocket fuel from yeah. the water um and so not only that but you have all the other things you might need for creating things like plastics or building uh, a, a base using 3d printed uh regolith yeah uh, melting melting the rocks with extreme heat and and building bricks with an extruder people yeah. are working on that on earth right now exactly. uh, you also have everything you need to make plastics on mars and you have all the rare earths just like on Earth, where these, these, these landed asteroids, um, you can get everything you need to make things like iPhones. So yeah. everything you need on Mars, on, unlike any other place in the solar system, uh, you have everything you need to create a technical civilization yeah. and live and thrive. Yeah. So uh, you know, I think that he's overlooking some of those facts in his article. Mm -hmm. One other thing I thought that was interesting in his article was uh, Percival Lowell's mistress was the first astronomer, first yeah. female astronomer uh, ever, and she gets overlooked a lot by history. Yeah. So check that article out. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. Yes. It's I worth think reading. Uh, yeah. th there are always going to be people that will, that are, what do you call it, naysayers, like people who just plainly go out and start denying stuff. Okay, he has a heavy background in, the, in his field and uh, obviously has a say. Uh, I believe that we should always be optimistic about these things. Uh, just a few years back, we never knew that there were gonna be, was going to be water on Mars, on the moon, or other places. We were guessing, but we were never guessing about the moon or Mars. Mm -hmm. And now the fact that we have found on, as you mentioned, we found water, we found water ice. This is all on the surface. And then we're thinking about, okay, it's going to be some, there's going to be some water in the ground as well. Uh, another thing is subterranean, uh, what do you call it? Accumulation of mm -hmm. uh, water and the reservoirs on the underground. We know nothing about that, both on the moon and on Mars. So these might, might as well exist. And that, that's a massive, uh, uh, source of energy and air and uh, fuel for civilization. Well, and there's pretty good evidence that they do exist. Um, mm -hmm. And then another, another point with those subterranean aquifers is that there could be life there now. Exactly. Like not only could Mars be something that we could bring to life, there mm -hmm. could be life there now in those aquifers 
So we need to go there and figure that out and drill and, and try to search for life. And that's yeah. another reason why going to Mars with human beings is so important. Yeah. Uh, it'll be a lot easier to, to do those searches with a human being astronaut than a robot. Yeah. And the, the technological capabilities that are developing on Earth, uh, it, it grows exponentially. Like we have waves of growth. And uh, in our time, I think uh, uh, our generation was on the uh, cusp between the old age, the analog, to the digital and right. we literally don't know what this age will bring about with regards to technology and how and we will solve things so going going out and being so straight about no this will not be possible i think it is not a good way to formulate things. absolutely couldn't agree more all right so nasa announced its next new horizons mission will be dragonfly hmm. it's going to be a quadcopter lander on the moon of Saturn known as Titan. So this is a very exciting mission. Um, Titan is a high priority target for space exploration because it's like an early version of Earth. It's yep. the only other known body in the solar system to have liquid uh, in massive quantities on its surface and a full cycle where the liquid evaporates, condenses, and rains. Uh, and this erodes the surface as the liquid flows back into the lakes and seas. But the big difference between Titan and Earth is that the liquid's not water, it's methane. Yeah. The, Titan is very cold. It's about negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit or 179 degrees Celsius, negative. Uh, pressure, a surface pressure 50% higher than Earth's. So the methane is found in both a gaseous and a liquid state. Mm -hmm. And the surface that's eroded is actually in large part water ice but it's as hard as a rock here on Earth um, because of the, of the cold temperature. The surface ice likely turns into a global uh, liquid water ocean under the interior of the planet, just like we believe Europa, Enceladus, and even Pluto also have. Yeah. So Titan's a very interesting world. And we sent a probe there called the Huygens probe as part of the Cassini spacecraft. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was back in 2005. And that was the first probe to land on Titan. And it found eroded river stones and all the building blocks necessary for life. Uh, it, but it was a very short functioning mission. Uh, it lasted less than a day. It was able to take some measurements and send them back to Earth, but it really wasn't able to explore Titan uh, for a long period of time. But this mission will, will be able to do that. Because unlike Huygens, Huygens was simply parachuted down to the surface and stuck in one place. The new probe Dragonfly will be able to uh, act like a drone that can land and take off and explore. So it'll utilize the lower gravity and the thicker atmosphere to roam the planet. And it will allow it to visit many different locations and they'll have high mobility and really be able to have a greater scientific vantage to explore more of the planet. So it could possibly find life on Titan. There, we've ne we haven't found any detection of macroflora or macrofauna, but it's very possible that life exists or existed in microbial form on Titan. One thing that is interesting is that back in 1990, <coughs> um, Dr. Zubin had a presentation, uh, Mars Direct. Mm -hmm. And then in that same presentation, he was talking about uh, uh, an X-wing copter that would be going to Titan. And it's funny to see that literally 30 years later, something like this is actually in the works with NASA. So again, yeah. someone, someone over there is listening to <laughs> the concepts of uh, Dr. Zubin and what's coming out of the Mars Society. Mm -hmm. And this mission Dragonfly will launch in 2026, uh, yeah. likely on a commercial rocket. It'll take about eight years to do some gravity assists and then arrive at Titan in 2034. Yeah. The primary mission will then commence for the next two years with the probe hopping no more than once each Titan day. Mm -hmm. Each Titan day is 16 Earth days. It'll have a uh, RTG, a multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Uh, it'll be that's similar to the ones used on the Curiosity rover and the New Horizons mission. 
and the activity will be during Titan's eight Earth day long daytime. Uh, it'll recharge over the nighttime of the same duration. It'll have a mass spectrometer and a neutron activated gamma ray spectrometer to analyze the chemical compounds from the surface samples. We'll also have various meteorological sensors to measure the local weather, take seismic measurements, and have the cameras on board photos and send those back to Earth. And while in the air, it will be able to use the suite of instruments to give greater context and map the surface, as well as to provide a better atmospheric profile than we know about today. So very exciting stuff. This mission is based at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. And like we mentioned, it, it won NASA's New Horizons competition. So it is gonna be the next mission in that program. The previous one was the probe that went to Pluto. The last mission that uh, landed on Titan that you mentioned, we, al we also got video from that, didn't we? Uh, yes, the Huygens probe, uh, there, were, there were some photos that came back from that. Um, it was very few, but it did show uh, what Titan looks like on the surface. Very mm -hmm. interesting world, lots of uh, flowing liquid methane. Mm -hmm. And then the, it actually, uh, the atmosphere is so thick, it's hard to see the surface yeah. of Titan from Earth. Yeah. But they were able to see it because they were uh, a lot closer with the Cassini mission. And they also realized that uh, Titan has weather. Titan has like snow kind of that falls. And yeah. it's the frozen methane. Very interesting world. <clears throat> with regards to uh, all the methane that is there, it would have been a science fiction kind of a pit stop for <laughs> uh, vehicles that want to, you know, get mm -hmm. some people. Yeah, if you have a spacecraft that uses methane, that's a great fuel depot to stop at uh, yeah. as, as you're exploring the outer solar system. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Okay, honorable mention news. So this is kind of our lightning round. We'll run through these real quick. Right. Um, there was a solar eclipse last week in Chile uh, down in South America. Really sad I missed that. My wife's Chilean. Uh, but honey, if you're listening, there's one again next year. We can go down there then see the solar eclipse. Uh, we saw the one in Oregon a couple years ago. It was very exciting. So, uh, but uh, there was, we'll talk a little bit more about the Mars Society chapter down there and what they did. Yeah. Uh, next item, Orion's uh, AA2 test occurred last week as well. This was the test to, uh, of the launch escape system, the, the little rocket tower that would jettison the capsule off of the rocket if there was a problem. They had a successful test there. So we're full steam ahead to use Orion for the Artemis program. Gene Krantz, the famous Apollo mission director, cut the ribbon at the new refurbished Apollo Mission Control Center in Houston. And this was part of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing later this month. They opened up the Mission Control Center, they refurbished it, so he was able to cut the ribbon there. If you're around Houston anytime in the next uh, few months, definitely want to go check that out. It's a piece of American history, and uh, it's really exciting to see. I think also on the NASA JPL uh, Facebook page, you will be able to see the space in 360 degrees as well for those uh, who want to check, it, check oh, that out. Oh, very nice. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, next, uh, a world smaller than Earth was found by the TESS mission. It's called L98-59B. It's 0.8 Earth radii, has a 2.25 day orbital period, and a surface temperature estimated to be around 620 degrees Fahrenheit. So a little balmy there. Uh, it's larger than Mars, but smaller than Venus. And there are two other planets in that same system, L98-59C and L98-59B. They're slightly larger than Earth at 1.4 and 1.6 Earth radii, respectively. And these also both whip around the star L98-59 with orbital periods measured in days and surface temperatures hundreds of degrees hot. So we're just finding more and more examples of planetary systems out there. And we're also starting to detect planets around the size of Earth. It's only a matter of time, I believe, that we will find an Earth analog out there. Um, and then that will be a high-priority scientific target. Yeah. 
Asteroid Day was on June 30th. So happy Asteroid Day. The U U.S. Space Command has created a new Twitter account. So if you're interested in the Space Force, you can go follow them on Twitter, the new uh, Unified Combatant Command for the U.S. Space Command. Uh, they're being stood up now, but they now have a Twitter account. You can follow them. Europe is developing a Falcon 9-like rocket to compete with SpaceX, who is dominating the market, quote unquote. So S SpaceX is making waves. You know, it's we, a lot of people have said it's only a matter of time that there's going to be a Russian SpaceX and a Chinese SpaceX and a an Indian European well. SpaceX. Well, it sounds like there is a European SpaceX now. Yeah, and an Indian SpaceX. So uh, that, that, that model of company that's lean and mean and able to build uh, rockets much cheaper and much higher performing than past aerospace industry designs that's happening this SpaceX really did disrupt the market and you're seeing everyone responding to that now what do you think the time frame will be for all these other countries to uh, gain I think we're in, we're in the middle of a huge race right now and I think in the next five years we're gonna see a lot of examples of other highly efficient rockets that are being designed right now and will start flying soon. It's going to be uh, Earth storming the heavens. Do you think that all these uh, countries will uh, try to develop their own rockets or do you think there will be some sort of uh, camaraderie with uh, SpaceX and their tech? Well, I think probably a little bit of both. I do think SpaceX will be the market leader, but I, don't, I think they'll have a lot of competition, which is a good thing. Yeah. And you'll see a lot of company um nation states wanting mm -hmm. to have their own rocket capability yeah. uh so they can launch satellites and they can uh, launch space missions and, and humans to space mm -hmm. i think that's going to be more and more important as time goes on for com for nations to show that they have that capability yeah. and also in the commercial sector um just you know we talked about the point-to-point -point air travel mm -hmm. uh you know that that the bfr may enable you know, yeah. I think in, in the next 10 to 20 years, you're probably going to have a lot of companies trying to do that. Same so thing, yeah. um, it's, it's right there, that, that opportunity for the team to go. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Amazon filing with the FCC to launch over 3,200 Kuiper Internet satellites to orbit. Uh, this is following up on the successful launch by SpaceX of the Starlink a satellite, uh, beginning of the Starlink satellite cluster. They launched 60 satellites weeks ago. Uh, those are now, for the most part, moved into their uh, their their high Earth orbit. And uh, this cluster that Amazon is getting approval for would be 3,200 internet satellites to orbit between 590 and 630 kilometers. So uh, for me, I believe this is very exciting because what this means is there will be multiple global internet providers mm -hmm. where you can get internet anywhere on earth very cheaply through the satellite system. And it's gonna really bring up a lot of the poorer nations, like places that don't have any infrastructure. They will be able to get internet really, really easily. Um, so I think this is a good thing uh, overall. The one thing I am worried about is all this potential space debris that these could cause. Yeah. But I know for the SpaceX team, they are working on how to mitigate that and how to deorbit those satellites uh, if they need to. But um, yeah, I mean, that is the one downside of launching something like a 3200 satellite cluster is that's picking up a lot of uh, orbits in, in, in Earth orbit and the potential for collisions is there. Yeah. And every collision would just make things worse. So. Um, what do you think, Ollie? I mean, what, how, do we, how do we juggle these two things of having lots of in internet constellations, but also keeping the, the orbits of Earth safe for future missions? In my mind, it sounds kind of like an air traffic controller uh, thing going on, uh, but we're not talking about aircraft. We're talking about satellites of all sizes. So uh, I'm thinking that they have pretty good technology to track this this. Uh, tech flying around up there but uh, and there's a lot of space like uh, we don't really grasp the volume of size as we're moving out from the earth so it's pretty sizable up there so when we're talking about thousands of satellites flying up there there's still a lot of gap 
for things to both fly in and out. So I'm pretty sure that they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I think there there is an opportunity for debris cleanup in Earth orbit, just like we're, we need to clean up the oceans on Earth. We, re we really should do something about all of the past space missions and satellites that are dead that are just floating up there. Uh, if there's a way to easily build like a small robotic probe that you could launch several of them and they can latch onto the debris and deorbit it back to Earth easily, mm -hmm. I think that's an opportunity for somebody to come along and do that to help clean up Earth orbit so that there's less risk of collision and it's safer overall for the International Space Station and any other human flights that have to use Earth orbit. Yeah. An interesting idea as you were talking uh, just came to me. Uh, it would be interesting to have this automated cleanup machine and then energize it with the hardware that is already up there. So if they have a high frequency uh, radiation that can charge the batteries of this autonomous thing that is flying up there, that would, that would be an idea. So you don't need to recharge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So. Okay, well, shall we get into uh, the main topic of our podcast, which is virtual reality and Mars? Yeah. Um, there's, there's several different things we want, Ali and I wanted to talk about today. Um, the first one is just to give everyone an update on Mars VR, which is the Mars Society's mm -hmm. project to bring virtual reality uh, to the Mars Desert Research Station project and really do some serious work with VR. Uh, and space exploration. So we, as many of you know, I've talked about it on this podcast before, the Mars Society did a Kickstarter about a year ago to raise money for phase one of Mars VR. We raised $31,000 and we used that money to scan the Mars Desert Research Station down in Utah. We flew a drone and we captured a square kilometer of terrain. And then we also did photogrammetry of all of the base facilities, both inside and out of all the buildings. And so what we're doing now is stitching all that together into a Unity application, which we hope to open source and give away to the public, uh, mm -hmm. not only to tell the story of what we're doing at the Mars Desert Research Station, but also to help train the crews that are, that are gonna go there. Because if they can train in VR, then they can really hit the ground running when they get there for real and physically. Mm -hmm. Um, so phase one has been underway and we're very close to the first public release. We hope to do that later this summer. I've been working with a team here in Seattle at the company Reality. Jeff Rayner is the CEO and he's been our project, our development lead on this for the project, uh, working with some of his team, but we are also plugging in volunteers. So if you know how to build the virtual reality applications with unity, or you know how to do 3D modeling, we could use your help right now. Um, we have a few things we need to do to clean up the existing models we created last year um, and do some things like uh, refining the tunnel designs that we've, we've created, uh, creating some 3D objects that we can use for the training. Um, so if you, need, if you can help us uh, with that, just reach out to me. Uh, James Burke, uh, and my email is jburk, J-B-U-R-K, at marssociety.org. Uh, you also can find out more about Mars VR on our website, which is marsvr.io. And uh, we'll be providing updates on the Mars VR project on this podcast. But this is phase one of many. Like, basically, this is a long-term sustained program of using virtual reality. Uh, to help explore Mars. And one of the things we hope to do is better tell the story, not only of what we're doing at the MDRS, but how you would actually explore Mars uh, using virtual reality. So what I mean by that is, imagine the first mission lands on Mars with humans and bring with them drones and rovers and they are able to capture the landing site that they land at uh, in three, 360 footage, um, capture all the objects, all the rocks and the, the hills and, and everything using LIDAR units, much like what we did in Utah um, with drones and, and with photogrammetry. So the astronauts are able to do that with some rovers and drones, send all that data back to Earth, 
and people construct a VR environment so you can actually mm-hmm. explore the landing site in VR back on Earth. So imagine we're able to do that very quickly and we can actually tell the astronauts where to go. I mean, you can literally have millions of people on Earth exploring the landing site in VR and finding things that the astronauts haven't explored yet and telling them to go check those out. And so Mars Society, we call that concept crowd exploring, like crowdsourcing or crowdfunding, crowd exploring. And so what we hope to do is demonstrate this. And we do this because we have a base in Utah called the Mars Desert Research Station. And we want to basically show this method of exploration. This is something we talked about in our Kickstarter video. Uh, Dr. Zubrin talked about this. And it's also something we're hoping to enable in the, in the near term by building the Mars VR phase one application. And then later, later on, adding some multi-user uh, scenarios to it so that you can actually have someone at the base uh, exploring the terrain and then someone else in VR exploring it along with them side by side. Uh, so one of the things we hope to do in the next year or two is enable a real-time communications link yeah. so that you could actually talk to the f- person exploring out there in Utah. Um, and you also could have multiple people in the VR app exploring together. So, um, so to do that, you know, there's a lot of technologies that we need, a lot of hardware upgrades we need to make at the MDRS. We need a better internet. We need to have better wireless communication between the EVA astronauts uh, and, and who's in the base and suit upgrades something that Ali and I have talked about, um, you know, how do you put 3D camera, 360 degree cameras on a suit, yeah. um, you know, and that would help enable not only capturing the 360 video of what the astronauts are doing, just for in general, just to capture that and have cool video that we can use for public relations, but also have that real time link of Here's someone out in the field exploring and you can actually see what they're doing in VR and explore along with them. The level of engagement that would generate is just phenomenal because not only people that aspire to become astronauts, uh, both professionals and kids, uh, young people that uh, dream about venturing out into space, right, and figuring out uh, how would that be? Like, what would you be doing? So in that sense, that would be a perfect tool to promote uh, this type of uh, development. Uh, and as you're mentioning that people will be able to kind of log in and help out both live and in an aftermath of an analog uh, mission or a real mission. Mm-hmm. So these are all exciting, um, exciting elements to look forward to. Uh, some of this stuff, uh, we've tried already back in 2015, 2016, with the Moon and Mars analog in uh, in Spain and in Marseille, France. Uh, we've been the first out to do many of these things. Uh, there are some links for people that are interested to uh, look at what we did, did there. And the project was called uh, Project Moonwalk, which was an EU project uh, funded by the Horizon 2020 program here in uh, Europe. And uh, yeah, we really set out to do a lot of the stuff that you're mentioning now back then and solve many of these issues, which also br- brought uh, me to you guys and the project with uh, Mars VR. Uh, yeah, and so Ali and I, were, what we're hoping to do in the very near term, uh, and we tried, we've tried we tried to do it the last several months, is capture some 360 footage from the missions at the Mars Desert Research Station. We sent uh, this camera rig to Utah and um, a fellow by the name of David Murray was able to uh, capture a bit of footage with it, um, kind of a proof of concept of doing that. Uh, And so we hope to really do that more in the next field season that starts next October. Uh, I'll be working with folks like the NorCal chapter that refurbishes our suits and the staff of the Mars Desert Research Station like Dr. Shannon Rupert uh, and others to uh, see if we can capture more 360 footage to show uh, the, the potential here. Um, I mean, just imagine this is a teaching tool for teachers to, to, to show their students Mars, uh, to show them space, to show them geology and astrobiology. I mean, this would be a great teaching tool 
uh, to actually show someone exploring the Mars Desert Research Station mm -hmm. and uh, exploring along with them. So this is a this is a tool that literally will trigger uh, your fantasy even further. So you don't you don't you're not set at the threshold uh, of a picture and then leave uh, the rest up to the imagination. You can put on VR goggles, really experience how it is to be at the Mars Desert Research Station. I've showed it off here um, to members of the uh, European Space Agency Business Incubation Center, and there's a video link to that as well. Mm -hmm. The responses are phenomenal. People are just blown off the planet, <laughs> literally. Yeah. No, and I've had similar experiences when I take our early access build of Mars VR Phase 1 out and show it at some of the events here in Seattle, like the VR meetup. There was also a conference for uh, middle school girls uh, called Women Fly that I went to and showed along with the Museum of Flight staff. Uh, we had several um, VR headsets set up uh, to show Mars VR Phase 1 early access build. The mm -hmm. response is always phenomenal. But it's always like people are blown away by being able to walk around uh, at the Mars Desert Research Station. It looks a lot like Mars, even though it's Utah, uh, but the, realis the realism that we have in that application, um, it just is, it's, very, it's a very visceral experience for people. They really feel like they're on Mars and walking around in a real place. Yeah. Um, and then just seeing the rocks and the geology, um, being able to, test out some of the training procedures like being on a spacesuit. Eventually we'll also have other procedures where you can go get us out in the field and get a sample, mm -hmm. bring it back into the lab and analyze it, or go, go into the greenhouse and grow cherry tomato plants, uh, you know, using Martian soil, you know, analog soil. Um, so we really hope to tell the story of uh, the ex exploration of Mars using this real place in Utah and using VR. Yeah. And so that's our, you know, uh, that's our future long-term goal is to be able to do this well. And uh, also to, as I mentioned, enable that real-time link between someone exploring Mars or yeah. exploring the, the desert in Utah and a person in the VR headset, wherever they are at home. Yeah. Uh, and this is all uh, your vision for the phase two part of things. So we will be coming back to that once Phase one is uh, out there. People have had the chance to kind of log into it, test it out, give some feedback, and then uh, we'll do another program and then cover what's coming up for phase two. Yeah, so for now, we're trying to get phase one done. So as I mentioned, if you know how to help us with Unity development or with 3D modeling, uh, we use a lot of Blender and Maya um, for the 3D models. You know, we could use your help immediately. Mm. Reach out to me. Um, and then after we're done with phase one, we'll be going into the phase two plans. So for that, um, what, I, what we'd like to do is create a Mars globe uh, in 3D in, in, that you could actually look at in virtual reality. And we've taken some of the first steps of that in, as part of the Marspedia project. Uh, we have a volunteer, Josh Baldwin, that has started working on a 3D Mars globe using the technology called 3.js that you'd, we would be able to put on Marspedia on the web page as our atlas section, as, as our areography section. It's kind of like geography, but for Mars, areography. Uh, we'd, uh, we'd put that on the web page, but then you'd also be able to put on a VR headset and look at that Mars globe in detail in the headset as well. And the idea is eventually that we'd be able to zoom in on the globe anywhere on Mars, you'd zoom in, you, you can go all the way down to the surface and walk around because the, we have the data for that already from all the NASA missions that have captured the altimetry data from Mars and all the images of the surface of Mars. Uh, there's, the work just needs to be done to merge those things together into a modern 3D system like 3.js. And so we've started work on that already. Yeah. But the vision long term is that we're able to take that Mars globe and really use it as a tool to explore anywhere on the surface that you'd want to go in VR. Yeah. Much like we talked about doing with the MDRS, having a real time link between two people exploring, one person exploring the real world, one person exploring in VR. 
uh, enabling that vision on Mars itself uh, mm -hmm. through this uh, project phase two and having this Mars globe. That's cool. well, what people need to understand, this is both uh, people working in the private sector, but also people working for government, uh, that what is happening with Mars VR and what you've initiated here is literally going to be uh, the main platform for uh, training and inspiring astronauts, both professional and aspiring astronauts, on how to behave uh, in, a Mar in a Mars setting. So uh, we're, we're at the beginning of uh, generating a training platform for this to happen. So with regards to what the gravity will be like and all that stuff, being able to simulate that is very costly. But being able to simulate what you're going to do there and what the procedures are going to be, this is not going to be costly in a VR setting. So training astronauts in the thousands and even hundreds of thousands, this is the way to go, not the way we're doing astronaut training today, which is... Yeah, very, very costly. You could even uh, mention how it, what the costs are for people to be at the MDRS, not to be able to talk about you know, buoyancy labs and stuff. Yeah, like I mean, Na NASA obviously spends millions of dollars training their astronauts. And if they were going to send humans to Mars through NASA, you know, those people would have millions of dollars worth of training before yeah. they left Earth. Yeah. What we're talking about here is on a much cheaper scale. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, what we're talking about with VR is, you know, we're going to give away the VR app. Like it's going to be an open source app. It's going to be free yeah. download on Steam and the Oculus store. And so you're going to be able to explore Mars for free, basically, uh, and train on how to do certain things for free. So um, that's, that's what we really want to open up. I would love to see Mars VR applications in every school mm -hmm. on Earth and in every museum on Earth. Yeah. Um, that's really why I got into this is to really show to the general public, the possibility of exploring Mars and that it's a real thing and that it's, it's something that, that we're gonna see in our lifetime. So that's really what we're trying to do here is build a platform that will enable everybody to explore Mars and to do it you know, for nothing, just for the, the time it takes to download the application. I'm thinking universities and even governments who have an interest in uh, sending people to Mars because this will be uh, an international uh, front mm -hmm. just as any other sort of exploration so that uh, people and governments will have to be thinking uh, 20, 30, 40 years ahead mm -hmm. and thinking that they will be sending people up there so starting to build the grounds for this will be uh, in VR uh, and not having their own analog analogs in their own places you know so uh, Mars VR is definitely something to build on and uh, the universities that we will get involved this is where uh, the Mars Society Scandinavia which will also be covering the Nordic countries uh, will be fronting VR technology and Mars VR for the universities the high schools the colleges to get involved in this uh, and hopefully have them chip in and help lift up phase two. Mm -hmm. And I've also been working here in the U.S. with Texas A&M University. There's a gentleman, Dr. Greg Shamatoff, who's a former astronaut, um, leads the engineering college at Texas A&M, and he's been a supporter of us. Um, been planning to uh, go visit him and his team. Uh, they've been working on VR projects there at the university for several years. They have a project called Spacecraft, kind of yeah. like Minecraft. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, definitely want to partner, continue partnering up with them and other, other universities here in the U.S. that are interested in helping us. Uh, another thing that we can uh, touch up on now is the Mars rover uh, competitions that the Mars Society... One of the things that recently happened was the University Rover Challenge. Um, Poland won. We talked about that in the last episode. But we also have another one coming up in Europe, the European Mars Challenge, uh, Mars Rover Challenge. And so that is in September. Mm -hmm. And so Ali, you, you had an offer to those folks that are participating in that competition. Yes. 
them and uh, the U.S. competition as well. So it depends uh, who is uh, uh, who's fast enough to get uh, to this solution. Um, just to give it a bit of a background, <coughs> uh, when I started off designing uh, the head rigs, uh, the 360 head rigs, the idea was that this camera system would be able to capture uh, everything around it in video. The video is a sequential series of pictures and from pictures we're extracting uh, 3D models which the technique is called photogrammetry, what you guys have been using out at uh, MDRS to capture the terrain. So uh, in 2016 we used the camera system to capture video uh, in Rio Tinto, Spain at the Mars Analog there and from that video we extracted 3D models. So uh, the rig, uh, the recent design that we did for a, ro a rover and also uh, could be used on a drone is the one that we're offering the Adapa 360X rig uh, so that uh, this solution will be able to capture everything in video uh, in 360 degrees and also we will be able to extract 3D models out of this. So this is the offer to uh, the upcoming teams, the team that uh, decides to uh, design their rover or drone around this X-Rig or incorporating the X-Rig. We're interested to see uh, the designs and we'll be um, uh, grabbing one of those teams to uh, develop this uh, solution further. Okay, um, so just to button up the Mars VR topic, um, if you want more information about the project, marsvr.io is our website, and stay tuned for future updates there. Um, and then if you're interested in the European Mars Rover Challenge, the site for that, roverchallenge.eu is the site for that. And uh, Ali, if folks are interested in your uh, rig, how would they contact you? I think uh, just to keep things uh, clean and straightforward, they can just get in touch with you. They've already got yeah. your information and then uh, we can agree on uh, what teams Sounds are. Sounds good. If anyone is interested in using the hardware that Ollie's mentioned, just reach out to me, James Burke, uh, jburke at marssociety.org. Okay, let's go on to some questions from the audience. So first question is from Ryan Cornell. Um, he asked, presence of methane on Mars, is that a fluke or a sign of life? Uh, what do you think, Ali? I think we just need to give this a bit of time. <laughs> People always want to jump ahead, you know, get to conclusions fast. I think we need to give it some time to figure out what this was all about. Um, it is, uh, considering the amount of water that we're finding on Mars and uh, the fact that we've established that Mars may have had uh, organic material on it at some time, <clears throat> this could be uh, some sign of life existing or existing uh, prior to our time. So yeah, it will be exciting whichever way it goes, I think. Yeah, for me, I think uh, the presence of methane on Mars is very interesting. We need to explore what that means. It could yeah. be a sign of life or it could be a chemical process, mm -hmm. but uh, it's definitely a positive sign that Mars is not a dead world like Homer Hickam was saying. <laughs> you keep hammering on that. <laughs> uh, next question also from Ryan Cornell. Uh, what, do we plan on returning anything back to Earth from exploring Mars? Mm. So bringing resources back like golden gems. So yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of talk of mining asteroids. So there was actually a company here locally to me in Seattle called Planetary Resources that had been working on that concept. I, I do think that that is something that will happen eventually uh, in the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. I don't, it hasn't happened yet, but um, yeah, I do. I def, there's so many resources out in space, you know, being able to uh, cheaply launch rockets from Earth. Mm -hmm. That's getting cheaper all the time with the work of SpaceX. It's going to enable new businesses that are able to bring back yeah. resources like golden gems. Um, I think if people go to Mars and come back, obviously they'll bring back samples of the, the rocks and the, the other geology features there, um, you know, different types of soils and things like that. 
but uh, you know that's more of a scientific thing than just bringing stuff back that is worth a lot of money. Um, I do think when they start getting into mining asteroids, uh, there's you know your average nickel iron asteroid has about a trillion dollars worth of precious metals on it, and there are literally tens of thousands or more asteroids like that orbiting the solar system. So, um, you know, the, the resources that we use on Earth are dwarfed by all that, so. I think in a sense that, um, uh, again, coming back to this VR thing, that uh, physically bringing back stuff from Mars to the Earth, uh, like uh, samples, is not necessarily, uh, needed if we can do the data analysis there and send the data back why would we need the physical thing here so uh, this is all about uh, cost effectivity and uh, yeah knowing where to put your money mm -hmm. uh, next question how can i volunteer for the mars society's technical projects so if a couple of people asked that um i mentioned i'm the it director there's a lot of different projects we're working on like like the VR project, but also things like the Marspedia online encyclopedia, working on the Mars Society's websites, working on the chapter websites, um, other things like helping with the Rover Challenge every year, helping with the organization of the Mars Desert Research Station, uh, Capcoms and the field season support, uh, making sure all the uh, crew reports make it up on the website quickly. So we all, we, there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, by volunteers at the Mars Society and folks can reach out to me. We also have a Slack chat tool that people can join. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But uh, the best thing to do to volunteer for the Mars Society's techno projects is to just kind of understand what they are and what people are doing uh, and, and where, where you might be able to fit in with your own skill set. So I always advise people to join the Slack and just kind of see what's happening on there and then offer to do something. Offer, you know, I, I, I see you guys are posting crew reports uh, to the website. That's something I could help with. Um, just volunteer for that. And mm -hmm. so um, it's all about really looking for opportunities on your own, not really waiting for somebody to tell you what to do because – uh, you know, a lot of us are, are, are very busy with, with all the activities we do. Um, so the best thing to do is just jump in and try to find opportunities yourself with all the, all the things that are happening. I think, uh, again, this all ties back to uh, our collaboration with regards to Mars VR. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing was the rover and uh, the rig that we've designed. And another thing is that you guys have done the um, uh, Mars Habitat uh, project as well as a competition on that yeah the, you're talking about the mars colony prize competition yeah. that just uh, we just announced the finalists for that this week and that was one of the things i was going to mention in the organizational news um yeah. and so that that just those the, the announcement of the finalists just came out they will be judged uh at the convention this october and we'll be publishing a book that have all of the designs of the mars colony um designs that were submitted and so, um, yeah, that's basically something that's happening this year that's been very exciting to see all these really hardcore engineering designs for Mars, uh, permanent Mars bases done mm -hmm. by people. And, uh, you know, we're going to really feature those uh, as time goes on. And so that it's really exciting to see, you know, things like that where people can submit these designs and then they're judged uh, against everyone else and it just makes for better designs overall. Okay, let's go into the organizational news we like to do on Mars Talk every episode. So what's happening at the Mars Society? Well, we're working on the planning for the convention this year. This year, our convention, it's the 22nd annual Mars Society convention. It'll be, it'll be held at University of Southern California in Los Angeles from October 17th through the 20th. Um, it's always a great event, uh, the Mars Society Convention. Uh, four days of talks and panels, uh, the Saturday night banquet, uh, with, where we usually have awards, and then also a great featured speaker. And then, um, you know, anybody's able to submit a paper and get a session track. Uh, we have, you know, 30 minute session talks 
usually about a hundred of those at the conference over the four days. And so anyone's able to submit a paper, uh, submit an abstract to get time on the schedule for that. This year, the abstract deadline is August 31st. And you want to use the website, not email. So you can use the website abstracts.marsociety.org to submit your abstract this year. Um, do not email those in. Uh, you want to use the website because that will allow you to get time on the schedule and also get your abstract into the printed material. But the deadline is August 31st. After that date, you're not guaranteed a spot. You're not guaranteed to be in the materials. Um, we're gonna lock those down earlier this year than we have in the past. So uh, upcoming con convention, um, very exciting. There's also gonna be a European Mars conference uh, in November in London. So we're actually doing our European Mars conference this year. I think it's been a couple of years since we've had one. Um, and the, the Mars Society UK chapter is taking the lead to organize that. It'll be in November uh, from the 4th through the 6th at the Institute of Physics in King's Cross, London, in the United Kingdom. Nice. And so um, yeah, definitely if you're in Europe, check that out. Um, you can go to their registration page via Eventbrite, um, and you can, if you are a Mars Talk viewer, you can search for European Mars Conference on Eventbrite with location London, uh, or go to the chapter website, which is marssocietyuk.org, and click events. And so this conference will welcome talks from space industry leaders such as Airbus and Lockheed Martin, as well as academic institutions such as Cranfield University and Oxford. Of course, Dr. Zubrin will also be there in person, and we can expect to hear from several European Mars Society chapter delegates, such as Italy, Poland, Switzerland, Spain, and France, to name a few. Uh, find out what Mars analog research they're currently doing in Europe. The deadline for abstracts for this conference is August 15th, and those can be sent in to abstracts at marssocietyuk.org. And if you'd like to volunteer at the conference, use the email address volunteer at marssocietyuk.org. And we'll have all this information in the show notes. Um, another piece of organizational news, we just launched a new website for the Mars Society. That was something I was working on with a couple of volunteers um, for the last seven, seven months or so. Uh, we just launched the new website. It looks great. It's got a new design um, and really a new kind of branding language that we're going to use across all of our websites. We also took the opportunity to update all the content on the main website, um, made sure everything was accurate and up to date. We have a new Why Mars section that, has, that features Dr. Zubrin's famous video clip from the Mars Direct talk he did at NASA Ames several years ago. Um, that's Got that clip has gone viral over the years and it's a great answer in less than five minutes of, of why we should go to Mars. Uh, we also have a new page for the Mars Direct mission that has mm -hmm. some additional details. And so check out the new website, it's marssociety.org. And we're also going to be rolling out a new members area soon. And so I'm working on that right now. Uh, we really wanna have the members area be something where members can connect with each other and also talk about different topics, and also find ways to get into some of our other resources like Marspedia and marsnews.com and our, our new Mars forums. We have all these kind of websites out there that do different things, we're gonna tie them all together around different topics, and we hope that the members area will allow us to be able to uh, get members plugged in with the topics they wanna to talk about and also some of the typical things you'd want to have for a members area, like being able to easily check your membership status and renew, mm -hmm. um, register for the conference, uh, access our online store and get discounts there. So all that is getting worked on right now in the new members area that should be rolling out in the next uh, several weeks. So, um, so that's really exciting. I'm really happy that how the web the new website launch has gone. Everyone's really enthusiastic about it. Gotten a lot of great feedback from folks that the website's designed well and very easy to use, very easy to find content. Uh, so I wanna thank Shauna Armstrong who did most of the design work, uh, worked with me late last year to get that going and then now it's out there. I'm really excited that this is, uh, that project is done.
So, uh, we also talked uh, briefly about uh, the chapters and um, mm -hmm. kind of trying to unify all the chapters into one push and supporting uh, the main office and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, what you guys are doing. Is this something that would kind of resonate again in the in a similar kind of uh, design for the websites? Yeah, so one of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna have a new chapter theme that uh, chapter websites can use uh, mm -hmm. if they want to. Yeah. that will be very similar to the main website's theme and kind of tie them together. Yeah. And so, um, you know, a lot of chapters are independent organizations. They, you know, th there's certain things they do that are similar. There's other things they do that are different. Mm -hmm. um, over the years, we've always tried to have some like marching orders from headquarters of, you know, hey, all the U.S. chapters, you guys should go talk to your Congress, mm -hmm. Congress people to, to support NASA, to support Mars missions save Mars missions in some cases yeah. um, and, and you know Dr. Zubrin and others still will, will issue challenges uh, to chapters uh, recently Lucinda offer our executive director mentioned that people should go out and do outreach activities and use the Mars gravity mugs that she designed um, so yeah one of the things we could do on the website side is have a unified design and branding language that all the web, all the chapter sites can use if they want to so that's a project i'm working on right now that we will have ready very soon probably in about a week or two mm -hmm. um, where any new chapter that uh get, has a website created uh will be able to use that theme and any chapters that want to migrate to that theme it will be really easy for them to do so uh, it'll be on wordpress and so it's easy to install that and, and use it yeah and once people get used to and uh, uh, get to know the main website then it will also be easier for them to man uh, maneuver in the other chapters website as well because it, it would recognize what's where and you know right yeah and that's also something we're going to roll be rolling out to our project websites too like the mars desert research station site and uh some of the other other things we do It'll there'll be a unified sort of navigation paradigm, and mm. being able to get around will be really easy once we have all these updates done. Yeah. Cool. All right. Some other chapter news. Um, in celebrating the 50th anniversary of Neil Armstrong's moonwalk, the Mars Society Utah teamed up with the Utah chapter of the National Space Society, and the Salt Lake City Bees professional baseball team. The highlight of the celebration at the Bees July 20th game will be featuring the Brigham Young University Mars Rover. It successfully competed at the University Rover Challenge at the Mars Society's Desert Research Station in Hanksville, Utah for the past 11 years. Wow. So uh, sounds like a really fun event. And uh, I know the, the Utah chapter has been teaming up with the baseball team uh, a few times so this July 20th game should be really exciting. Uh, shout out to Mars Society Chile who had the opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, we admit it, we're a little jealous. Uh, they were front and center for the July 2nd total solar eclipse. Their contribution to promote this event was to create an educational animation picking the track of the eclipse across the country. Mm. So very exciting stuff. Uh, Mars Society Chile is relatively new as a chapter, but we're really supportive of them. And uh, good job, guys, way to go. And we'll, hopefully we'll see you next year when the next eclipse happens. Um, mm. I'm convince my wife to go down there. Uh, Noted.com is a major New Zealand online news source. Recently featured Mars Society New Zealand President Haratina Mogasanu Mm -hmm. uh, we know her as Hari. She's been a volunteer for us for a long time. She was part of the Mars Desert Research Station Capcoms for a while. That's when I first met her. She was featured in this news article. She calls herself New Zealand's first Martian, and she, her day job is the newly created role of senior science communicator at the Space Place in Wellington Botanical Gardens Carter Observatory. Where, so it's a very prestigious position. She's basically the chief science communicator at the country's largest observatory 
and she continues to build public awareness through education. Uh, and she's uh, had this great write-up in the New Zealand news, news source, noted.com. So congratulations, Hari. A lot of us here in the U.S. Uh, read your write-up. We're really proud that you were featured there. And it's really awesome to see folks uh, around the world getting more interested in Mars and seeing the work that, that we've all been doing for the last several years pay off. So good job, Hari. Women are doing a great job promoting Mars. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great that we have uh, folks like Hari, Lucinda Offer also is a, has a similar role with the Royal Astronomy Society in, uh, in the UK. And it's really great to get out, to have folks that are getting out there talking about uh, the Mars, uh, Mars exploration, Mars society activities, and getting mm -hmm. the young people excited about STEM. Yeah. You know, that's just so important for the future of not just space exploration, but just society in general. Yeah. On that note, a shout out to Anastasia Stepanova, who is uh, just about to finish off uh, the uh, NASA IBMP uh, project, uh, which is the Sirius 19 project. And we were actually there in, uh, in Moscow this February and did a documentary and a run through the facilities there, a very exciting project. And she's been uh, in, that, in those facilities uh, locked in for four months now. So it was yeah. a very exciting experience once she comes out. Absolutely, so great job, Anastasia. I met her, she was part of the Mars 160 crew that we did. We had a crew that spent 80 days at the MDRS and then planned to spend 80 days up in the Arctic base. Um, she was part of all that. I also helped, I helped her um, and another person, Jennifer Holt, create a short film about the Mars 160 mission. But uh, it's really awesome that Anastasia got to go to the the serious mission and she's been in there in there for 500 days or sorry or four months um but uh yeah and and we'll feature the video you, you guys did uh where you interviewed her we'll have a link to that in the show notes okay chapter spotlight so this time it is the scandinavian chapter which you lead ali so tell us about the scandinavian chapter well, the Scandinavian chapter, as you well know, uh, was a direct result of me and you being in touch, uh, which is uh, a little bit over a year now. And uh, after our uh, great level of communication and chemistry <clears throat> and uh, kind of finding the tone and our ideas merging, you know, uh, I found out that uh, being able to represent the Mars Society and uh, having a chapter in Scandinavia would be the way to go. So we're just about a year. On the 18th in 10 days, we'll be a year, year old. Uh, we have over a thousand followers on our Facebook page, which uh, has wow. grown substantially in just one year. Uh, people are uh, responding very positively to, uh, to this initiative. And uh, my perspective on this has been to create a, a little ecosystem on Facebook around uh, the Mars Society or, and our chapter, um, posting every day uh, the news that is coming out, both with regards to the Mars Society and the MDRS and their activities over at the US, in the US, and also uh, everything that is happening in space, literally. Lately, focusing a little bit about uh, what's happening on Earth with regards to geology and, you know, uh, our, um, our atmosphere. So uh, taking a scientific approach to things, posting pa uh, newly uh, released papers and stuff like that. So we don't know uh, everyone who's uh, following our page. So I'm guessing that we have everything from uh, just people on the streets and uh, ordinary people to scientists. So trying to cover like a broad uh, basis with regards to space. So yeah. We hope that uh, it will be even more popular moving forward once we start releasing uh, more uh, material from our collaboration uh, with regards to Mars VR and uh, other stuff, other activities. And also, once you have this um, template for the website, then we will uh, launch that and people will be able to uh, become members in the Scandinavian chapter 
which as I said, will cover the Nordic uh, countries. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll take it from there and see uh, what develops from that. Uh, one major thing that we will be pushing is the VR capabilities. Again, everything connected to the VR Oslo business cluster. Uh, if you want to find out more about that is vroslo.no. Um, the Mars Society is a partner, an honorary partner member there, which we're very proud of uh, and uh, also respect highly. So uh, yeah, get involved. It's all about engagement and uh, taking the initiative to help out uh, forwarding the Mars exploration initiative. Do you have any activities or events coming up that you'll be do organizing in uh, Scandinavia? Uh, not yet, which are directly a Mars Society uh, event, but we have uh, a VR Oslo event, and at every event, uh, I normally cover Mars related uh, topics with regards to VR. Our next event is on the 27th of August at the Oslo Science Park, which is our main venue every year. Uh, actually, uh, every time we have an event, we have about four events per year. Uh, and this time, <coughs> which is our third time, we're focusing on women's activities. So we're calling it uh, Women in VR uh, and inviting uh, a lot of women to take the stage. So we found out that this is needed. Uh, We've had about 15 events since 2015 at uh, the Science Park. And uh, each time we, we do invite a lot of women to come and take the stage, but we still found out that there's about 20 to 30% of women showing up. So we thought, okay, what if we have an exclusively like uh, a women's event, not just exclusively for women to show up because uh, men can uh, come as spectators as well, of course. And uh, show up to exhibit their works, but uh, for on on stage to have women present their work, and it's very popular. It showed that uh, women do need to uh, be treated separately and uh, exclusively. That's where they feel that they have the space to show up and kind of take the stage. Uh, unfortunately, that's in my mind that's a bit uh, sad that they don't feel that they can show up when we have our ordinary events, uh, but at the same time, we also need to respect that women are women and men are men. So this is a predominantly uh, men's uh, arena. Tech has always been that way. So uh, opening the door for the women quite literally is, uh, is needed. Yeah, it doesn't have to be that way moving forward. We definitely want to welcome in all the women to the tech industry yeah. and the Mar and Mars exploration and all the activities we do at the Mars Society. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think having our executive director be a woman and uh, the head of the Mars Desert Research Station is also female. I think yeah. we're trying to really show the diversity in what we're doing, um, that it's not just a male, it should not just be a male dominated field. Yeah. So um, that's what we hope for the future. Yeah. So it's definitely needed. And this is, uh, this, these dynamics are something that we will also uh, transfer into uh, the Mars Society Scandinavia chapter so that we, uh, we go in, in front as a good example of how uh, this uh, gender balance should be. Uh, and that uh, we understand how things have been male dominated uh, throughout history and that we need to uh, counterbalance that uh, in the future. So that's uh, a little bit about uh, how we see things for the Mars Society. <clears throat> uh, and of course, as we were talking about, uh, since we started off with uh, our friendship and our talks on Mars VR, um, I felt the need that the main office, the Mars Society main office, uh, should be supported by uh, the, uh, the chapters, the international chapters, and also, of course, the uh, American chapters, so that we, we kind of have a main goal that we're pushing towards and that uh, we don't go out and brand ourselves as if we were a separate organization. Um, uh, in general, uh, splitting up the energy that goes into a topic, that weakens the topic. So if, if everybody's uniting in the main in the, in the main front, 
then uh, well, it's then it's unified and it has one single force. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, a lot of strength to uh, be found in that, and a lot of good lessons to be learned in that. So maybe you could tell a little bit about uh, your experience. No, that's a really good point, and I th I hope that some of the initiatives we're working on now with like the new members area, for example, we're going to be able to closer tie together the work that the chapters do with what headquarters wants everyone to do and mm -hmm. the, what's going to be more effective for uh you know everyone to work on in terms of getting the word out to the public on mars exploration organizing activities like lobbying uh, mm -hmm. congress folks in the u.s and uh doing different public outreach events globally and having a, a specific literature we're giving out specific demos like the mars vr demo and other other things like lucinda's gravity jugs um you know if there's ways that we can kind of arm the chapters with standard information standard um outreach activities then it'll make them more effective because we'll all know how how better to do them and we'll be practicing them together so yeah it is something i think it's a really good point you make that the chapters are stronger when they work together with headquarters uh, not going off and doing stuff on their own mm -hmm. um, that may be counter or just different um, than tangential kind of to what uh, what we're trying to do at HQ so that's yeah. no, a really good point and I think I hope that you know things like the, me the new members area and increased communication between the chapters through like Facebook the new Facebook group we have for example um, all those things should help with what you're talking yeah. about uh, and on that note, <clears throat> again, uh, trying to walk in the front as, a, as an example, uh, we will use Mars VR and the technology that we're developing in relation to Mars VR to be uh, an offer to our other chapters. I've tried to do that already with the Mars Society Australia and actually Mars Society Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, the responses have been mixed, just to put it nicely. Uh, and that it shouldn't be that way. So uh, I think the chapters uh, that are out there should make use of the expertise that is being developed by the main office and in collaboration with the main office. So uh, everyone that is uh, ready for and looking to use VR technology, AR technology, we are at the forefront on a global scale. So this is this is nothing that you can just go out and get your hands on easily uh, the level of expertise that we're housing uh, here. So we've been the first in many aspects. Uh, one of the things that people don't know, we were the first in the world to connect uh, the uh, VR gear to 360 video. So nowadays that, that's a given, like people take it completely for granted, but we were the first out in 2013 to do that. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of firsts, so we don't need to list all those up now, but we've had some serious ones. And that again is what brings us to the Mars Society and uh, our collaboration with you guys. So moving forward, uh, if there are any chapters out there that would like to make use of this, and we both know that they should make use of this, right? So get in touch with James and uh, he will then channel th things through. And, yeah. yeah, and that there's, we have, for example, if you need hardware to demo mars vr at your event like we can we can or we can arrange that you know yeah. if you need help understanding how this stuff works and training training folks that are going to be running the event i mean i've i've done probably several dozen at this point uh events where i've shown mars vr and i've probably taken a thousand people through it at this point yeah. um I, I it's not that hard to do and no. Uh, it, and, and the responses are universally positive. I've never had anyone not like being in the VR headset other than maybe they get a couple of people got a little bit of vertigo, but they yeah. still thought it was cool. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so, you know, it, this is something that is a really visceral experience. Mm -hmm. You can really touch someone's life in a, in a different way with VR and really show them the possibility of being on Mars in a, in a way that they've never they've never experienced before. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and really they won't be able to unless they go to Mars themselves. Um, okay. So, 
you know, this is definitely something that I'm a, obviously I, we're both huge believers in using for outreach yeah. and we want to help all the other chapters be able to do this yeah. uh, like we're doing. So, and uh, just to uh, come back to uh, value creation and the reason I started this uh, international business cluster is value creation. So um, in our business cluster, we have other business clusters represented. So we're covering a business cluster for media, uh, a business cluster for offshore industries, uh, subsea industries, uh, health tech, ed tech, and another VR uh, business cluster. A small one, but still a business cluster. So uh, the technology that we're developing now with relation to Mars VR is directly transferable into other sectors. So the, uh, the marketing term for that is from cradle to cradle, right? So uh, this is a value creation, can be, a, uh, can be value creation on a national basis for any country that uh, the chapters are in. So, and our network is global. So for example, in Chile, we have VR people in Chile that can show up, bring gear, and really introduce that chapter into the use of both VR capabilities, 360 and AR. So that's a jump start that they don't need to spend hours and days and months and years to get a hold on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so folks, take advantage of this opportunity um, to use VR to show the exploration of Mars to the general public it's really worthwhile uh, to do. It's very effective, mm -hmm. and uh, you'll be on the cutting edge of w what's going on as well. Yeah. So I call it a quantum jump from <laughs> not having anything to do with VR and 360 and these technologies to literally, in a day, having access to all of these capabilities, which, which normally doesn't come for free uh, at any stage. So this is something that they should really make themselves. Okay, and then one last thing. Uh, we always like to have a little lighthearted segment at the end of the show. So I saw recently uh, you were playing around with your sword and uh, kind of doing some Fruit Ninja type stuff. Fruit Ninja. <laughs> Tell us a little. Well, it's, that's, a, that's a game that a lot of people are familiar with, but I think yeah. what you were doing really was cans, right? Yeah, so um, I'm a martial artist. I've done Taekwondo at least uh, 25 years. Uh, I have done that professionally as well. I've uh, coached uh, two national teams, uh, both the Norwe members of the Norwegian and the Thai national teams. So uh, it's been quite serious. And uh, since 2005, I've been uh, trying fencing a bit, and specifically with the Chinese war sword. That's what you saw on, in that video. So I was surprised that you said you were going to cover this in the yep. podcast. I'm rolling the video right now, so. <laughs> it's crazy. So yeah, this is um, th this all brings brings it back to uh, focus, and um, execution is a hard word, but that's what it is. Uh, <laughs> of, uh, of energy and directing energy uh, in a particular way, so to hit your target, and uh, well, one thing ties into the other. Uh, it looks pretty violent, but uh, that's not what it's about. It's uh, about focus and uh, really showing what the result of that focus can be. And uh, that, that can isn't tied down in any way. There's just water in there. And uh, I'm hitting the, the top part, which is the hardest to kind of share. So yeah, I was a bit- uh, Is there any story behind the sword? Um, it's just a really cool sword. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, Very so, cool. Uh, everybody that wants to uh, try this stuff out, straight, go straight to uh, Japanese uh, samurai swords. I tried that out. Uh, my practice began with that, with wooden swords. But then I found this thing and I was blown away. So it's just impressive. So yeah, that's, that's about it. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Ali, for being here with me today. And thank you, everybody, for listening to our podcast. Uh, we're just starting out with Mars Talk. This is episode seven. So we'd love to get your help 
uh, please like, subscribe, comment, and share this episode. You can find all of our episodes and links to social media at our website, marstalk.org. Uh, all of our social media handles are at Mars Talk Podcast. So you can find us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram with that handle, Mars Talk Podcast. To get previews of what's going to be on our show and stay up to date on the latest news, you can follow Christopher Tarantola on Twitter. And his handle is Architechnid. That's A R C H I T E C H N I D, Architechnid. Uh, you can follow me, James Burke, J A M E S B U R K. There's no E in my last name. Uh, Ali, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do so? Uh, they can get in touch with me on email uh, at a.z at adapa360. That's a b a p a 360.com. Uh, or just find me on uh, Facebook. So. Cool. So a, a dot Z for us Americans uh, yeah. at adapa 360com Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> hey, and they can, they can, of course, also check out uh, uh, the Adapa 360 Facebook pages if they want to have a look at what, what we're up to. So. Awesome. Okay. And you've been listening to Mars Talk presented by the Mars Society. It's been produced by Lucinda Offer, Nora Hovey, Christopher Tarantola, and myself, James Burke participants in this episode were Ali Zari and myself, James Burke. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. When Christopher does the show notes, he always titles them TMS, MT, and the number of the episode and he puts three, he puts 007. Yeah. So today he was really excited because this is the 007 <laughs> episode, you know, like James Bond. Yeah. And uh, hosting it is not James Bond, but it's James Burke, you know. Let me see. I have a hat here. Maybe I can pick one. You can tell them the name is Burke. James Burke. There you go. <laughs> it's like Odd Job, right? Remember Odd Job, the guy that had the hat that he threw? Yeah. And the statue's head fell off. Congratulations on a good job, 007. <laughs> Tell them the name is Burke. James Burke.